Windebank's body was found in the mummy's case. Inside it? Precisely. One of the guards, Henry Witherspoon, discovered it when making his rounds. He noticed that the lid was askew and a hand was sticking out of it. By the look on his face when he came to summons me, he must have thought that the mummy was attempting to leave its resting place. Some of the guards have been a bit on edge, you know, since the stories about Dr. Turnbull's death. What happened when you arrived at the scene? With this, we insisted me in removing the lid. And there was the body of James Windebank. Around his neck was a bandage of linen. And the mummy was missing? No, it was in there too. Underneath poor Windebank, completely undisturbed, not a length of its sheeting unraveled. Who had access to the exhibit room? Well, the room was officially closed yesterday while we set up the exhibit. But the museum was open and we took no extraordinary precautions to keep people out. Can you think of anyone who might have wanted to kill Windebank? None at all. I actually didn't know him very well. He did work for the museum, you see. Uh, he was with the London University. The university and the museum were joint sponsors of the Ketterbeck expedition. Mr. Johnson, can you think of anything whatsoever that might shed some light on this affair? No. I'm very sorry. I can't think of a thing. I only hope that all this publicity doesn't keep people away from the exhibit. It's quite amusing, all this hoopla over a mummy's curse, I must say. Not so amusing, of course, the murder of three Englishmen. Have any of your reporters uncovered anything new? Actually, I've been in Paris the past several weeks. Just returned to London on Tuesday. I've had no involvement with the writing of any of these articles. I believe they are all the work of Philip Travis. He's one of our young reporters. For a short time, he was the Egyptian correspondent. Was he sacked? No, no. He returned to London just a few days ago. I gather he was reassigned to cover the case from here because he had some familiarity with the murder in Egypt. Do you know Travis? No. Never actually met the chap, although I hear he's a bit of an odd duck. Thanks for your help, Henry. Anytime. Let me know when you catch the mummy. That's one scoop I'd like to get. Hello? Is anyone there? Mr. Farming, are you at home? Apparently so, Watson. Look! Oh, what ghastly business. Everyone will assume the mummy has struck again. Hardly a plausible assumption. This poor fellow has a knife in his back and not a scrap of sheeting about his neck. Mm. How very observant, Holmes. Ring up Scotland Yard. This case is simple enough for them to solve. You've solved it already? Elementary, my dear Watson. Obviously, it was the butler. Butler? What butler? Exactly my point. A man as wealthy as Akram Fami would always have a manservant about him. After the foul deed, this one obviously beat a hasty retreat. <laughs> Such a tragedy. Fine men all and such outstanding scholars. I still can't quite get over the shock of it. We understand. Professor, we're looking for background information on these three men so that we can understand how their murders might tie together. Well, let me begin with Dr. Turnbull. Ebenezer Turnbull was responsible for organizing the Carterbed expedition. Quite a remarkable man, really. This was the first time he teamed up with James Windebank. Professor Windebank was one of our most popular lecturers. In fact, several of his former students were also eager to accompany him. I recall him saying that he was having difficulty choosing. Weatherby turned out to be the lucky one. Though it seems far from it now, doesn't it? I suppose Smith and Travis turned out to be the lucky ones after all. Smith and Travis? Peter Smith accepted the invitation to join another expedition. As for Philip Travis, he was quite keen on accompanying Professor Winderbank. In fact, he became exceedingly upset when Andrew Weatherby, a postgraduate student in the department, was chosen instead. Took it rather personally, I should say.
I'm sorry, but I don't know anything about the death of old... Whatever his name was. Andrew Weatherby. Fact is, I only saw the gentleman once, just as we were boarding. And I'll tell you, I resented the first officers questioning us on the matter, and I resent yours. The whole voyage was a disaster from beginning to end. Our accommodations were positively abysmal. They wouldn't even let us bring Dickie into our cabin. Dickie? Her high-strung, distasteful little mutt. How can you say that, Meryl? You know Dickie is a blue-blooded Yorkshire terrier. <coughs> Mumsy will be with you in just a moment, Dickie Keens. <laughs> <coughs> He's a bit under the weather, you know. That's why we were only able to stay in Egypt for two weeks. Dickie was so disappointed. He so wanted to see the Sphinx. Mr. Holmes is not interested in your incessant whining, Louise. Oh, now I whine, do I? There was a time you thought I had a lovely speaking voice. It's true, Mr. Holmes. He once adored me. <laughs> no doubt. Oh, for the love of God, Louise, spare us your blubbering. <laughs> Sorry, fellows. I don't mean to be brusque, but I am too occupied at the moment to concern myself with these so-called mummy murders. Perhaps if the mummy's solicitor were to contact me, then perhaps I would consider defending him. Now, the thing what does strike me as odd is the passenger list of the Eastern Empress. Now, I'm not saying it has anything to do with the mummy murders, mind you, but it was a bit out of the ordinary. What was Hogg? Akram Pami, for starters. He's a well-known importer, he is, for a price, a considerable price by all accounts. He can acquire whatever one's heart desires, be it jewels, art objects, or even wild animals, if that's what you fancy. I'd say he was on board that ship to transport something very valuable. The presence of one high-powered importer on a London-bound vessel is hardly reason for suspicion. Right, oh, but Abdullah al Saad was also on board. Oh, yes, the well-known agent for the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. You never miss a trick, do you, Holmes? Well, whatever it was what Farmy was carrying, I'd say it was something those Turks wanted to get their hands on. Well, well, if it isn't Mr. Sherlock Holmes, London's most overly praised amateur sleuth, needing the help of the yard again. Are you going to stand for that, Holmes? Let's just see who proceeds to solve this case, Watson. Inspector Lestrade, my good man, I'm looking into the cause of James Windebank's death. <laughs> I should have known. That murder has brought out every crank in the city. I think the professional police can wrap this one up. All the same, could you tell us what you've discovered to date? One dead archaeologist, no suspect, uh, no motive. And what of Andrew Weatherby's death? Have you looked into that? I have talked to Captain Ramsay, but uh, we have no leads. Look, I'm not even sure that Weatherby's murder falls into our jurisdiction. And if it doesn't, you're not going to find me worrying about it. As it is, I have enough murders to take care of. Here it is, Holmes. Egyptian mummies are embalmed bodies preserved to facilitate their resurrection. Many mummies have been found, and they are almost always the bodies of pharaohs. The pharaohs believe that one day their bodies would be brought back to life. See History of Egyptian Mummies by Pettigrew, London, 1834. Very good, Watson. Beg your pardon, but could I have a word with you, Sir Jasper? Ah, uh, Dr. Watson, of course. 
Are you investigating the death of Samuel Sneed? I've just finished with him. Uh, no, we're interested in James Windebank. Ah, the mummy's latest victim, of course. <laughs> Oh, who hired Holmes for this one? <laughs> King Tut? <laughs> oh, that's a jolly good one. Actually, we don't have a client on this one. Uh, just for fun, eh? Well, about the only thing I can tell you is that that mummy has very powerful hands. What do you mean? The trachea was crushed along with one of the vertebrae of the neck. Death was instantaneous. Snap. But the paper's reports say that the, there were mummy wrappings found round the neck. Uh, just window dressing. Now, without question, it was bare hands. The bruises and the way that the vertebrae was crushed leave no doubt about that. Thank you very much for your time, Sir Jasper. We're very much appreciative. Uh, not at all, Watson. Uh, you will let me know when you've convicted the mummy. Beg your pardon? Well, so I can perform an autopsy on him. Would be most fascinating, don't you think? Mm. <laughs> Pettigrew wrote this book over 50 years ago, and there's still nothing better on the subject. Fascinating. Just fascinating. And what can I do for you today, Whitson? It's Watson, sir. Watson, yes, of course. We're interested in what you may have learned about this mummy case. Oh, so these days it's mummies you're chasing down with that fella, Helms. It's Holmes, sir. This is what I said now, isn't it, Whitson? Yes, I believe you did, sir. Uh, let me show you what I found so far. Uh, this is the bit of linen that was found round the neck of James Windebank. I examined it thoroughly and it is quite old, perhaps thousands of years. However, it is not the murder weapon. Are you certain of that? Aye. The linen is quite old, but it's not at all strong enough to strangle a grown man. Very interesting, sir. I also found something quite fascinating. Take a look through this glass. Do you see those short hairs on the fabric? They look precisely like hairs. Of course they look like hairs. But what kind of hairs? They're not human hairs. They're dog hairs. Now, look at this. This piece of linen was found round the neck of the victim on board the ship. Well, his name was Leatherby or something. Uh, it is also quite old. And on it, I found more hairs. More dog hairs? No, my dear man. Monkey hairs. I've not yet been able to identify the precise species, but it's just extraordinary, isn't it? Quite. But what do you think it all means? Well, I'm not the sort who likes to jump to conclusions, Whitson. But I can assure you that neither of these bandages were the murder weapons. Well, Holmes, it appears we're out of luck. The clerk told me that O'Brien is off on holiday. I know only a very little about two of the unfortunate gentlemen. I do recall that Turnbull was quite an eccentric chap. I don't believe he ever married, nor did he take his rightful place in London society. And what of Windybank? A quiet academic sort, as far as I can tell. Married to a woman called Hildegard. There was one spot of controversy that I can recall. It seems a few years back he had a run-in with the Anti-Vivisectionist League. No, oh, but of course. It seems that during a lecture on the advancement of science, he spoke of the autopsy of his own pet. A recently deceased Yorkshire Terrier. Well, I can tell you the Times received a great deal of letters to the editor condemning him on that one. <laughs> Even one from a Louise Fenwick who threatened to vivisect him. Oh, dear. Well, then I surmise it's Weatherby you know nothing about. Well, now that you mention it, I believe he was assisting Professor Windebank in that lecture series. <laughs> We had just come through a rather grueling storm, so I sent my first officer, Luther Tenney, down into the hold to check on the condition of the cargo. He reported back post-haste that Mr. Weatherby was lying dead among the Egyptian artifacts we were transporting. I turned over the helm to Tenney and went below to have a look for myself. And did what you see confirm Tenney's report? Mm. 
Unfortunately, yes. Weatherby was lying next to that coffin, or whatever it's called, apparently strangled. I went back to the bridge and put Tenney in charge of the investigation. And what did he uncover? Well, you'll have to ask him for the specifics, because I can scarcely recall the details. There was a couple of blokes in here just a fortnight ago. What mentioned the Eastern Empress? Never seen them before. Haven't seen them since. One was a swarthy fellow. Arab, unless I miss my guess. The other was an old English gent. I overheard him say something about a bird and later caught the name of the ship. I hope that helps you. Care for a drink, eh? Here is a passenger list you requested, sir. Sorry I can't help you, Ducky, but Mr. Smith has been out of the country since the middle of March. He's a good-looking bloke, except for the dirt under his fingernails. Mr. Turnbull apparently left what little he had to the Egyptology department at London University. And Windbank left everything to his wife, Hildegard. What about Weatherby? Ditto. Everything was left to his wife, Clarissa. Although being such a young chap, it hardly seems that he had much to leave at all. Let me tell you, a murder, even by a 4,000-year-old mummy, was only one odd thing in a string of bad luck on this voyage. What sort of bad luck? It all started with the crew, really. Seamen are a rather superstitious lot to begin with, and the idea of carrying about a 4,000-year-old mummy had them shivering in the timbers. We almost faced a bloody mutiny. And there were the passengers, a strange lot. I can tell you that reporter fellow, Travis, did us no service at all with his mystic mumbo-jumbo. He and Professor Winderbank had a regular war of words going on about whatever powers this mummy was supposed to have. And there was the two Arabs. Arabs? Interesting. Do you recall their names? I should hope I do. One was called Fahmy. He always carried around this curious little box. No clue what was in it, but Fahmy never let it out of his sight. The other one's name was Al Saad, and he spent most of his time lurking about watching farming. My guess is he wanted that box. Sounds like you had your hands full. I haven't even told you about the fight yet between Mr. Weatherby and Mr. Aruburu. Over what? Weatherby's wife, I'd say, though they were a tight-lipped lot about it. I see. Tell me, Lieutenant, we understand that you were the first person to discover the bobby. Yes, sir, I was. Captain Ramsey sent me down to inspect the hold. I went immediately over to them Egyptian crates. Professor Winderbank was particularly anxious about him, you know. Could you describe the scene as you remember it? I'll never forget it. I just made my way to the back of the hold, and I noticed that the top of them crates, the one what carried the mummy's coffin, was raised up kind of funny like. The coffin lid was laid off to one side, and there was Mr. Weatherby, all sprawled on the floor next to a bowl of ashes. He'd been strangled by a length of the mummy's sheet. It was bloody gruesome, I tell you. Poor bloke's eyes popped out like a couple of sausages on a hot iron skillet. Quite a vivid picture, don't you agree, Holmes? Quite. And you reported this to Captain Ramsay straight away? Absolutely. In fact, the captain put me in charge of the entire investigation. And what did you discover? Did anybody have any contact with Weatherby on the night of the murder? Not that I know of. 
I could account for all the crew. And the passengers were in their cabins as far as anyone knew or would say. Nobody saw anything, heard anything, or knew anything. Besides, Weatherby was seasick from the beginning. He stayed pretty much in his cabin all the time. Maybe that's why the lovely young Mrs. Weatherby was gallivanting about. With Uruburu? Yes, indeed. And what of the bowl? Where is it now? The bowl? With the ashes. Oh, yes. You know, now that you mention it, I don't recall ever seeing it again. So you've been reading my articles in the Times. I'm honored. What do you think of them? Quite interesting. You've clearly been following the murders quite closely. Who do you suspect? I believe it is the work of the ancient Egyptian god Pumatef and his goddess Neith. Be serious. I couldn't be more serious. You see, Mr. Holmes, although I am a journalist, I was actually trained as an Egyptologist. I know all about these mysteries. That's why my articles carry the force of truth. And what is the truth, Mr. Travis? The truth is that the Egyptians discovered the secret of life. What we call science is mere child's play compared to the knowledge they had. Look at this. Do you know what this is? It appears to be a mummified animal of some sort, a monkey perhaps. Precisely. Write a conversation piece. I've been using it in some very important experiments which, if successful, will unlock the secret to bringing back the souls of the dead. I've been working on it, Mr. Holmes, using these tanner leaves. Watch. Uma Lotus. Licantina. Boo-ra! It appears that the soul of this particular monkey has no intention of making a reappearance. It's only a matter of time. I know it is. After all, these secrets have been buried for thousands of years. These things don't happen overnight. But it will happen someday. This is my mission. I believe I'll leave you to your work, Mr. Travis. Now, don't go yet. But let me show you more. Thank you. Some other time, perhaps. Dr. Turnbull, he was a strange one, he was. Ollie ever at home, always traipsing about her Lord knows where. May I take a look at his things? Oh, suit yourself. All he had is a big pile of books about Egyptian mummies and a few maps. He was a son of an earl, he was. Though you hardly tell from looking at him, poor fellow. Do you really think this mummy thing's what's done him in? Creepy, I says. If this is an inconvenient time, perhaps I could come back, Mr. Uruburu. I wouldn't hear of it. Just a bit of a hangover. I've weathered plenty worse than this. I'm investigating the death of Andrew Weatherby. You were on the ship with him out of Cairo. Did you happen to make his acquaintance? Weatherby, a most tedious fellow. So tedious, one might want to do him in. Don't be preposterous. In my condition, I couldn't have done anything of the sort. What condition was that? And I thought you were a great detective. The first night out, a few of us threw a bit of a bash that went on until we docked in London. Did Mrs. Weatherby attend this particular bash? She was the guest of honor, you might say. I'm very sorry to intrude on you in your moment of grief. Oh, that's quite all right. You know, Andrew and I hadn't been married very long. Long enough to know if he had any enemies? Oh, Andrew was so unassuming. Everyone liked him. Including Mr. Uruburu? I really loved my husband. I'm sure you did. Oh, English toffee, my favorite. Would you like one? Please. 
Sorry. You'll have to open this yourself. I've never been any good with these things. James was so thrilled when Dr. Turnbull invited him to join the expedition. He felt he had spent his entire life reading books about archaeology and now was finally getting an opportunity to go out into the field. Tell me, Mrs. Windebag, when your husband returned, did he discuss the deaths of his colleagues? Of course. James was extremely upset. I know he did not believe a curse to be responsible. My husband was a man of science. <laughs> 